I'm delighted to introduce Sam McKenzie, um, who's currently a postdoc at uh, NYU in the Uri Bajaki Club. Um, Sam is an undergrad in neuroscience at McGill. Um, for moving to VU uh, for his PhD, where he worked with Howard Eichenbaum uh, on representation of similarity structure in the Rodentic campus. And I think a, a signature feature of Sam's work has been that he's sort of been at that interface of human cognitive neuroscience and rodent neurophysiology. And that's really novel work of you know, using techniques that came from one or the other and sort of really doing that kind of cross fertilization between those two different areas. Um, and that's also evident from this title today, to linking the idea of memory space to something that's really a circuit and synaptic level uh, mechanism. So, delighted to have you here with us today, Sam. Um, some time here to work with you, and uh, please help me welcome Sam McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Matt. It's really been an honor and a pleasure for me to be here. Um, at NYU, I'm really kind of operating at the most highest level of production, and most of the people who I'm interacting with are really interested in the exact molecules which are involved in dictating a synaptic interaction. So it's been incredibly refreshing for me to be amongst the people who are really thinking a little bit more abstractly um, and uh, in a more uh, model-based way. Um, and so I've been interested in a long time about what is a, a memory space really mean? How do we organize a set of experiences in our mind? And I'm just going to ask you to think about a set of experiences that took place in your kitchen. And you can think back and reflect upon doing that. And then if I ask you that, it seems like your memory space is being fundamentally organized by location. Of course, I could just as easily ask you, all right, now think about a set of experiences where you're sharing a meal. And now it might seem like the fundamental dimension with which you organize the experience is by what you're doing. For example, if you're dancing or working in a lab or, or eating. And of course, I could also ask you to think about things that have happened over the last couple days while we've been at this course. And now it might seem like your memories are organized along the temporal dimension. And so it's amazing that all of these different kinds of representational spaces exist in our mind, and they can be queried just as easily as me asking you to navigate versus one of these dimensions versus the other. How does the brain do that? Um, and where does this structure actually lie? And so the kind of tools that I have used to try to answer this kind of question is extracell extracellular electrophysiology. And so we've talked about that in a number of different lectures um, since we've been here. Um, and so this is just a diagram showing what tetrodes look like and dispersed amongst the excitatory inhibitory cells and the racket campus, which is part of the brain that I study. And when you do these kinds of recordings, what you see is that for each of these cells, you get these beautiful kind of place fields that animals are just asked to randomly wander about an environment. And so this kind of observation had led people to believe that maybe the fundamental dimension, which is organizing representation of the campus, is location. And the reason why they believe that is imagine that you've got a set of cells, which is active, and you've got a place cell. So this cell is going to be firing every time you're in this one position driving a very high correlation amongst the overall representations for the places that are happening in that spot. And of course, when you go to a different location, another cell is going to be active, driving there to be a high correlation of those representations as well. And so if you see a high degree of space coding, this suggests that that's going to be the fundamental dimension, which is organizing your experiences, which is what inspired this theory that the hippocampus is actually giving you a, a map of your environment, and which other kinds of events are laid down upon. But at least when we introspect, it seems like we can organize our experiences along many other different kinds of dimensions. And so when I was working with Howard at Gambam, I wanted to design a task in which animals had multiple different kinds of dimensions with which they had to organize information. And we could assess the neural firing patterns and how they reflected each one of these dimensions at once. And so I wanted to talk about this um, actually because a number of the people have decided to look at this data set um, during this course. And so I wanted to describe actually what the, the data looked like and what the task was in a little bit more detail. Um, and what we train the animals to do is when they're on this side of the environment, they were confronted with a choice, the binary choice. Do I dig for a little serial reward in this one object, the scented terracotta pot, or do I refrain from digging and uh, go to the other pot? And over on context one, this uh, object A is always rewarded, and over on the opposing context, the reward contingencies are flipped, and now the animal needs to choose the other pot. And so animals can learn this, they can learn this kind of task within a single day, and we overtrain the animals, and this is the data set that some of the people here are working with. And then on the fourth day, they're presented with a novel set of objects within the same space. And so now, in context one, the animal is to go for terracotta pot C, and the opposing context, the reward contingency is flipped, and now the animal is to dig in terracotta pot D. And so what's nice about this task is there's a couple of different kinds of um, similarities and differences between each individual event, which is the animal going up to one of the pots. Um, events where the animal is sampling uh, object B 
you know, these are related to those other rents for the animal sampling object D because they're always going to be rewarded or not rewarded in the same places. However, the events with objects A and B are related to one another because those two pots are always presented at the same time. Um, and of course, these uh, positions are related to one another in the spatial domain because these two positions now uh, require the animal to make the identical kind of behaviors to get the reward. And so there's a couple of spatial and non-spatial dimensions to this task. Um, what's the, uh, the object identity of the, the pot that the animal's confronted with, the position of the animal within the context, the context itself, which is describing the overall um, behavior that the animal is meant to do uh, when he's confronted with one of these pots, and what's going to be the potential re uh, reward outcome when the animal does the behavior. And so how does the hippocampus actually organize um, all of these uh, dimensions of the animal's experience? Um, and so this is the kind of data that we saw, and this is data from a single neuron, and we had four different objects in four different positions, and this is just a peri-event time histogram for this one cell in each of those four by four. And this is, if we saw this kind of data here, that this neuron is firing in response to all of the different objects every time the animal is in position four. And so this is what a place field would look like. Um, and so if you, all of the cells look like this, I think we could conclude that the hippocampus is really fundamentally organizing this set of experiences by the location of the animal. Square clarification, time zero is when the animal leaves? The time zero is when the animal's snout touches the terracotta pot. Right. Yeah. Um, but this is data from another neuron here. So this neuron is actually firing in response to object D in all of the different positions, though clearly there's a modulation by position as well, firing more here in position two than the rest. And so this is some kind of conjunctive code, where this neuron at least seems to care about both the, the object and the object place conjunction. And if you look across the entire population of neurons, you see that on any given trial, some of these neurons are active more than their baseline, and some of them are suppressed relative to their baseline. And so if the system was just random, you would expect on any random trial, just a different population of neurons would be firing at some random order. And fortunately, that's not the case. There's some kind of trial-to-trial -trial reproducibility, where the cells that are activated on one trial become reactivated when the same object is presented in the same position. And those that are silenced are also re-silenced. So there's some kind of consistency in this code. Now, switching out the object identity, but keeping the reward potential and the position and context the same, you can see that these patterns begin to diverge. Some of the cells that are active are still active, but some of them that were basically firing at their baseline now fire in response to this different object. So you might say that these neurons now are caring about the object identity that's in front of the animal. We can switch out both the object and the reward potential, but keep the position locked. And you can see that these patterns begin to diverge. And now when the animal runs to the other context that's presented with the same object, you can see this is almost anti-correlated pattern of activity, where those neurons that are fired are silenced, and those that are silenced are, are active. <coughs> And so what we'd like to do is now be working in this kind of ensemble space and to find this pattern here as the representation of each of these individual experiences and look to see how these different representations compare from one trial to another to kind of get a handle of what is the representational space, at least for this task. And so we've seen a couple of these kinds of matrices before. Um, this is a similarity matrix, taking each one of those ensemble representations and correlating every trial with every other trial. And so the trials were given semi-randomly. I've sorted them here according to the dimensions that we imagine would be important. And so, fortunately, the repetitions of the same object in the same place have very correlated kinds of neural representations. And so this was giving this idea that at least the campus kid is not just doing something random. Um, and you can see that these uh, trials that took place in opposing contexts here are highly anti-correlated, as you can see by this sea of blue. Um, but there's other kinds of patterns here, too. So, for example, these are the events that are all taking place within the same place. Um, uh, and this and, uh, has the same reward outcome, and only the object identity is different. And so the, the high correlation for the repetitions of the same object compares to this decrease in the correlation, this difference here is telling us something about how much this region is caring about the object identity in front of the animal. And what we can do is we can build um, this kind of hierarchical um, dendrogram analysis to get a sense of what kinds of features the hippocampus is caring about. And so since we have four different objects in four different positions, we can do a pairwise analysis and say, all right, which of these two different conditions generates the most correlated pattern of activity? And in every case, it's for those two different kinds of positions that take place within the same position and have the same reward outcome. And so if we look to see how correlated is the neural ensemble activity for rewarded items in position one, you can see the average correlation here is about 0 0.5. And now we can repeat this kind of algorithm and say, all right, which of these pairs have the most similar kind of neural activity? And now again, in each case, it's for those events that took place within the same position. 
where the, the, the equivalent reward outcome is more correlated than those that have the opposing out the reward outcome. And the average correlation for events that take place within the same position is now about 0 0.25. And now we can do this again, but for the, each of the, the, the quartets. And now you can get the average, um, the, the most correlated pat uh, events are those that take place within the same context, where if, between the two positions it looks like they're completely orthogonal to one another, but of course it's actually going to depend on what's happening inside of each of those positions. And you see an anti-correlation between the events that are taking place in those opposing contexts. From that similarity matrix, that was that sea of blue that was taken, that I showed you before. And so this is a very compact way to get to, uh, an overall estimate of what are the kinds of dimensions that are driving variants in your brain region of interest, or how are the receptive fields of the neurons laid down across each of these different kinds of events. And so Howard Eichenbaum's vision was to take this task where there's a lot of different things that neurons could code for. And since we, unfortunately, we can't record from the whole brain at once, but he has had, had a generation of graduate students and postdocs do this task over and over again in the lateral antiretinal cortex, the medial antiretinal cortex, the perioretinal cortex, the postoretinal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the orbital frontal cortex. And we can look to see what do these kinds of hierarchical relationships look like in the same kind of behavior across all of these different regions. And so what you can see is if when you record from the medial antiretinal cortex, you get a very similar kind of hierarchy, where it looks like the overall context in which the animal is is driving the major kind of pattern separation of um, the neural representations. And you get position coding, and you also see object coding. And this is meant to be in a part of the brain that only cares about space, but you actually see very strong valence coding, object coding in this task as well. Sorry, yes. So it seems like, if you go back to this, we are in a bigger one. Um, so position-free in general, the correlation, the similarities are just lower compared to, you know, Position four, and then for for context two, for context one, it seems like position two there is more compared to position one. Was there like behaviorally a difference in how they, how, how you know? Some it's animals? it's possible it's behavior, but it's, I think it's more likely it's going to be luck of the draw. Where do we happen to have enough neurons? And I bet that if we, you know hippocampus has millions of neurons, we could be recording thirty to fifty at a time. That's right. And so. Where we happen to get lucky, where the place fields get laid down, is going to dictate where we're able to actually have good estimates. But this is across how many rats? This is across five rats. Five rats. Is it kind of not at all possible? One of the positions was easier to reach physically. It no, like that should be normalized, and we look at the behavior. The behavior is equivalent to the okay. positions. Um, okay. And so in the, the lateral antiretinal cortex, here again we see context is the major determinant, which is driving the anticorrelations in the neural activity. But now, rather than position being the next important dimension, it's actually uh, which is the, uh, the objects that the animals are sampling. Mm -hmm. And so here, in this, it's only two different kinds of objects, and so the behavioral demands of the animal and the object identity are confounded, which is why I'm calling this the valence of the object. And you can see the LEC and the perioral cortex, you know, this is meant to be our object processing stream coming into the campus, and they have a very similar overall kind of hierarchical structure to the representations, we reduce these strong object coding as well. And so, and this, yes? What was even odd? Um, um, even audit. so here we just split the session, um, you know, into half, half and half. Oh, so we can at least get to the sense of what's the trial to trial reliability of this kind of analysis. Um, and so the same kind of way that Jim, Jim Haxby was describing that there's the best way to think about the different kinds of brain regions is um, actually interacting and how are they representing information in this kind of correlational strength. I totally agree with that framework here. And just uh, in the rat, just like you saw the human, we can kind of quantify what is the ways that these different interacting brain regions are parceling out the kind of variants where all of the information is present, but different dimensions of the experience are driving pattern separation um, to a greater or lesser degree. Um, and so I'm interested, yes? The context is a spatial thing, right? It's spatial, does well, well it's confounded, it's, it's confounded. Because we, we have the, the spatial location of the animal setting up what is the, the policy that it, the animal should do when confronted with a paw. So you can imagine that it, you could have another kind of context, which is the sound that was playing. And so whatever the sound is should dictate what I should do with the two paws in front of me. That's not how we set up this task. How we set up this task was which side of the room I'm on should dictate it. And so this is context, both spatiotemporal context, as well as kind of... Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the occasion center in the Peter Holland kind of vocabulary. Yes? That's ortho orthogonal. So it's a, you know, those are anti, you know, it's, but not, it's not 
There's no relationship. And so in the place cell literature, uh, people have really made a big deal that if I'm trying to predict what place filter is going to be laid down, it's like flipping a coin. It should be a random draw. And so if I'm standing on this side of the room, I shouldn't be able to predict what are the place fields on that side of the room. And if I do the correlation, then it should be zero. But the items that have the same, we, we don't know because we don't have two different objects with the same valence. So what we would need, there was only two objects in this task. If we had another, you know, the four object version where we had two different objects that had the same behavioral outcome, then we could have a, another set of branches down here. And the reading of the correlation here would do, give you a sense of how correlated are all of the different instances for events of the same valence. What this is saying is that for instances with opposing valence, you have unrelated kinds of neural activity. Condition on them happening in the same context. Is there a way to read the plot that, like all the, in the lower left panel, the first four, A1, A1, A2, A2, yeah. have positive valence? Yes. And then the next four have negative valence? Exactly. And That's exactly right. two streams are? That's exactly right. Yeah. Sorry, that wasn't clear. And what probably made it a little more uh, confusing is that this, we have four different objects, and this, we only have two different objects. And so the final branch here is an even-odd split. Well, the final branch here is actually two different objects. So we could do, like, another set of branches here where we're doing an even-odd split. Um, and so as a physiologist, I'm really interested in what are the mechanisms that are driving this kind of decorrelation structure. And I've gotten particularly interested in lateral inhibition because we see these strong anti-correlations here between the representations that are taking place between two different contexts. But you can imagine that there's inhibitory processes here which are driving the pattern separation at every level in your hierarchy. And I can ask you to organize your information according to place or uh, time or activity, which means that this kind of correlation structure you should be able to update on the fly very quickly. And so what are the potential mechanisms of the brain that would allow large groups of neurons to become correlated and anticorrelated on such quick time scales? And I think this kind of mechanism is very promising. Um, and so you know, I really want the synaptic hypothesis of memory, that when I learn something, we're changing the connection strengths between the set of presynaptic um, inputs to a postsynaptic cell. And I'd like to try to show that actually one of the important synapses that changes when you learn something new is either the excitatory drive to an inhibitory cell or the inhibitory drive back to an excitatory cell and setting up that kind of correlation structure, which means that the location of your receptive field is not just due to the level of excitation that's coming into the cell, but the overall balance of excitation and inhibition that's coming into the neuron. So that's actually not known right now. It's controversial in the field. How can we go about beginning to test this idea? Um, can we detect this kind of synaptic connectivity in vivo? And can we show that it uh, functionally varies over time? This is the kind of data that we collect. This is data recorded from the silicon probe. It's time on the x-axis, voltage on the y-axis. And you can see that there's these tick marks. Those are the action potentials from single neurons. And I'm showing a raster here of three different neurons on the bottom, um, maybe four different neurons. And I just highlight one event here, where one neuron fires, and then another neuron fires in quick succession. Here's a thousand uh, such events. The black waveform here is showing the, the waveform from a pure middle cell, an excitatory cell. And the red waveform is the channel where the inhibitory uh, neuron was recorded. And you can see that there's this large accumulation of spikes from the inhibitory neuron just after the excitatory spike. And so this is what you would expect if there's a true synapse here. But every time I fired, my downstream neighbor should fire at some certain lag. And we can quantify this kind of relationship by some cross-correlation analysis. On the x-axis is the time after the presynaptic spike or the reference spike. And on the y-axis, is a, a, a quantification of the a number of times that you can observe the spiking in the other neuron at each of these lags. So you can see for this particular pair, we have a high degree of synchrony here at around one to two milliseconds after the spike. This is not enough. This kind of synchrony could come from a true anatomical connection, but it could come from some hidden third party that's making these two neurons fire with a phase lag, or it could come from some kind of complex combination of these two things. So how can we actually extract some kind of positive relationship 
from this kind of correlative data that we collect. Could it also be because of some kind of You mean what is the role of the excitatory drive to the inhibitory cells? Yeah, most of the people actually consider inhibitory cells in their models assume it's just to stop them from having epilepsy. And I'm saying that there's not random connectivity here. There's actually very structured connectivity between the excitation and inhibition. Right, but the equation that, that would be running this for everywhere, is, is it possible that it's because things want to be just normalized? Yes, yes. And so it's then you get a chicken and egg problem. You can get so so if you're increasing excitation, then you need to have balanced increase exactly. in inhibition, or you could change the inhibition somewhere, and then you would need to have the right. about it. So yes, I think that they're working hand in hand together. I agree. Okay, so how do we actually make some kind of causative statement here that there's a real synapse and it's not this kind of overall uh, secretly driven by a third party? What we need to do is a perturbation experiment. We need to drive this presynaptic cell and then look to see what happens to the postsynaptic cell. Critically driving the presynaptic cell in an anticorrelated way from the rest of the network. And so there's a couple of ways that we've found we did that. One of which is we glued a glass pipette to a silicon probe, and then with the glass pipette we did just a cellular recording of the presynaptic pyramidal cell, and an extracellular recording of the postsynaptic interneuron. This was Dirk, work done by my collaborator Dan English, and he injected current through the just a cellular pipette into the presynaptic neuron. Now critically we're going to look to see what happens in the postsynaptic cell. And so these are, this is what a justicellular signal looks like. It's kind of this funny hybrid between an intracellular recording and an extracellular recording. And this is now the cross-correlation between the spontaneous spikes from the justicellular recorded cell and the extracellular spikes from the interneuron. These spikes of the brain produce, we didn't produce. And you can see here, this is a putative connection. So now what we're going to do is we're going to drive spikes in the justicellular neuron through current ejection. We can drastically increase that cell's firing rate, thus decoupling those spikes from the rest of the brain. And even with those evoked spikes, we're able, to, uh, we're able to drive very reliable spiking in the postsynaptic cell. So now we hypothesize there is an edge here in our graph because of this kind of um, interaction. And now we can confirm through this, uh, through this perturbation that indeed that edge exists. So we've identified 30 different pairs that show this um, kind of strong peak in the cross correlation. And in each of the 30 pairs, we, when we inject um, current to the presynaptic cell, we could observe very reliable spike in the postsynaptic neuron. And there's a very strong correlation, not only in the existence of the peak, but also the magnitude of the peak, which means that this spontaneous interaction is telling me something about the strength of the overall interaction, the synaptic coupling between the pre and the postsynaptic cell. Um, and so what we did with this paper is we said, all right, now we've got some labeled ground truth. Um, can we build an algorithm that just looks at the spontaneous data to predict when we're we going to observe that kind of interaction? And so we found two features that were highly predictive. One of them was the distance of this peak above some slow varying time, um, slow varying baseline, and the other was the distance of this peak above what happened at the anticorrelate, uh, the anticausal direction. So you would expect to see the synapses to inject a high frequency synchrony between the pair in a positive lag as respect to a negative lag. And so when we, um, you know, my, my boss, Gary Bajagi, has been collecting these big databases now for 15 years. They're all online. I put a link on the Slack channel. And you can apply this algorithm and with, to all of this data, it's all you need is spikes, and generate these kinds of um, connectivity maps, where we can relocate the position of the neuron with respect to our silicon probe by looking to see the waveform is the biggest. And we can draw edges in this graph by looking to see when we see highly reliable spike spike coupling. And I've color coded them here as a function of how high that peak is above the slow baseline. And so I think that this is getting us uh, close to what's looking at the, the, the microcircuitry of these parts of the brain. Unfortunately, we don't have the feedback from the inhibitory cells to the pyramidal cells. That's a much harder problem. Um, but when we're thinking about memory, you know, this is not the answer. You could get this from doing electron microscopy, and you'll believe it much more. We want to know how information is bouncing around this network and how these synapses change over time. And so when I say change over time, you know, we can have all of these different time scales. We can have changing over the order of milliseconds, minutes, hours, days. Um, one of the things I became very interested in is how is it that the recent spike history is driving the synaptic coupling interaction through short-term plasticity. I'm not going to have time to talk about that today, but it looks like that these synaptic interactions are actually working in the frequency domain as bandpass filters. Um, what about changes in moment-to-moment -moment, uh, moment -moment changes as the animal is moving around its environment and making these kinds of decisions? Um, in particular, what about on this task? And so, of course, we're recording um, excitatory cells and inhibitory cells in the task. We observe this kind of anticorrelation. 
and we see changes in what's the excitatory drive to the inhibitory cells. So this is just a place field map of the neurons on this task. This is the, the place field map of a, a, one of the presynaptic cells, and this is the place field map of the postsynaptic interneuron. You see already that there's actually some kind of context coding for this interneuron here. This is what the synaptic coupling drive looks like, the spike transmission probability is what we call it. We can see that the spike transmission probability for this pair is consistently higher on the trials that take place in context one as compared to those that take place in context two. And this is just data from another pair. You can see this pair, for whatever reason, seems to have higher coupling strength in context two as compared to context one. So obviously, we're not having antichannels being trafficked up and down on a minute-to-minute -minute time scale. This very powerful synapse is being gated as a function of where the animal is in space. And so we can do the same kind of correlation analysis, representational similarity analysis, uh, but now not with firing rates, but with spike transmission synaptic coupling strengths. And you can see that overall, the synaptic state in context one is much more similar to than to the synaptic state in context two. And so this becomes a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. You know, is it the synapses that are driving the firing rates, the firing rates are driving the synapses? And the answer is yes. These are all interacting with one another. Sorry, just a, just a slow answer to what happened here. So these are Post minus pre, what we're seeing here in every cell? No. So here, for every pair, for, uh, for every trial, I'm going to get what's the, spike, the coupling strength. And now on every trial, I'm going to have the, the representation of the trial rather than in firing rates over neurons over the synaptic coupling strengths over synapses. During which time are these? The whole, I mean, a lot. It's going to be the entire session. Every time, the, every time the animal walks into that context, uh, I'm going to start look, assessing what's the coupling strength. The this is overtrained data. Okay, so if you, if you look at this in the beginning, there's this... We can take a look. Yeah. yeah. I wonder whether... Yeah. You, you see the point. Whether it emerges. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And really when people are talking about synaptic coding and plasticity, I think that they're imagining these synaptic changes over much longer time scales, you know, amp-channel shuttling and vesicle binding and things like that. So can we see kind of evidence that might be taking place over these longer time scales? Um, and does that change learning? And so David Dupre, in a beautiful set of experiments, suggested that that might indeed be the case. What he did is he trained the animal to find three hidden goal locations on what's called cheese boys and maze, and then assessed what did the place fields do. And what he observed is that the place fields tend to migrate from some random location to the goal location. And then he looked at the spike-spike coupling between the pyramidal cells and the interneurons over the course of learning. And he showed that some of these kinds of coupling strengths increase, and some of them decrease. Again, setting up this chicken and egg problem, is it the firing rate migrations that are changing these kinds of synaptic interactions, or vice versa? And we would like to see now, um, in other kinds of more controlled settings, what is the relationship between the receptive field plasticity and the synaptic coupling? Because, of course, as the animal's learning, many things are changing. The animal's becoming sated, the trajectories are systematically becoming biased. Can we have a more reduced preparation to look at this interaction between receptive fields and synaptic coupling? And we're really inspired by the set of experiments that were done by Jeff McGee, where he injects current through an intracellular pipette into a single neuron on the, one of these trials. And then on all subsequent trials, you can see that this neuron now begins to fire in that location. What's happening to the other neurons in the network? What's happening to this neuron's coupling strength to the other engine? What change to allow it to continue firing in that spot? Um, and so um, rather than doing um, these very painstaking intracellular experiments where you can only look at one cell at a time, we wanted to now drive neurons optogenetically. And we've got this nice technology in the lab. These micro-LED probes were fabricated amongst our recording sites, our um, tiny LEDs, where we can drive very small populations of neurons. And so here I'm just showing you with a one second Gaussian um, stimulated on, these are called shanks, on shank two, I can drive the, all of the different neurons on this uh, one location, but 250 microns away, I'm not driving the neurons. And so at fixed times and in fixed anatomical locations, I can really increase the firing rate to get the of neurons. So I can repeat this kind of McGee experiment. We're going to have animals running back and forth on a linear track. I'm going to pick on a particular trial. Let's begin to drive the neurons in a local neighborhood with light. And you can see I can increase the neurons. If I'm stimulating shank one, I can make the neurons fire on shank one and then look, look to see what happens to the receptive field properties opposed to stimulation. So here's um, data from one neuron. It's position on the x-axis, trials on the y-axis. I like my trials to start at zero and go this way. Um, each tick mark shows an action potential from that neuron. I begin stimulating that neuron on this trial, and you can see it, it continues to fire in that position. 
So this is a replication of the Jeff McGee effect, but now using optogenetic stimulation instead of current injection. This is data from another neuron. Here this neuron had a place field towards the end of the track. I stimulate and the place field remapped to some other place. This is not what Jeff McGee observed. This is much more complicated to explain. And I observed even more bizarre things. This cell was not stimulated, but changed its firing properties. And so this is now beginning to look like a, a local network reorganization, where both the stimulated and the non-stimulated cells can change, and they change not always to the place where I'm stimulating, but to other places on the track. Hmm. <coughs> Sorry. Was this the MCA one? Yes. And then the robot's behavior changed going more towards some places after the Not reliably, but um, I did see sometimes that the robot's behavior would change subtly. How many neurons change the ones that you could actually this, this becomes a threshold question, like what do you want to call a change? I see more change with stimulation than without. Oh, you mean over time? Or, like, if I look to see... Is there more change if you stimulate more over time? Or no, it's just like a series of neurons and they are the only ones affected. So I played around a little bit with the number of stimulations that I gave and I didn't see a big effect um, of the number. So I, I took this, I did a couple of them with a single stimulation and I brought it up to <coughs> 10 stimulations. Um, but uh, as a control, if I just don't stimulate, I see more kinds of changes in my stimulation trials versus my non-stimulation trials. Yes? Uh, like across your different sh uh, like, uh, shanks, are you able to uh, basically have like, inhibitory and excitatory options? So you could like essential, I mean, it might be really a great experiment. It might be really difficult. No, I mean, it's, it's technologically possible with different wavelengths of light. Yeah, um, I haven't done those experiments, but they're possible. Uh, so this is just showing the overall ensemble of data. So here I just align, um, I'm picking a random spot uh, to stimulate on every different day. I've just aligned now all the place fields from all the different neurons to that stimulation spot. And I've sorted them by where their place field is post-stimulation. And so um, critically in this experiment, what I do is I take the animal off of the track, I put it back into its home cage for several hours and bring it back again. And I hope you can see that this order of the place field is more similar two to three hours later, even after being in the home track, than they were before the stimulation. So they remap and remapping is stable. So bring this with the earlier things that you were showing. Yes. So to look at if you had an um, idea of their correlation, so basically of their synaptic strengths before the stimulations. Yes. Would you be able to predict which ones are going to realign? I don't know, but I haven't tried to do that. Yeah. Okay, but of course we were interested in looking at the synaptic coupling here. And so what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is an algorithm to try to estimate in a, in a continuous way, what is the synaptic coupling strength um, over time? And this is work that I've done with Roman Huzar, who is an alumni of Dartmouth and who's here today. And so what we can do is we can get a time estimate of what is the synaptic coupling between a pair of neurons throughout the session. And we can look to see, does this coupling strength change after some critical event? It could be a ripple, like what I pitched um, during the, the project pitches, or in this case, it could be our stimulation. And so here is just data taken from these two different epics here. And you can see that for whatever reason, this connection looked like it starts strong and then gets weak. We don't know why it gets weaker, but it looks like there's some kind of change here. And so now this is all of the data, um, actually from the session that I've given you um, with, for the project pitch. Um, and so each of these rows here is a pair of, uh, from an excitatory cell to an inhibitory cell. On the x-axis is time. This is showing when the animal's put on the track, taken off the track, and this is when the, the, I, I stimulate for the first time. And the, on the color axis is a normalized coupling strength um, uh, for that pair over time. And I hope that you can appreciate that some of these pairs seem to be acting in concert, where they are rising together and falling together, and actually in an anti-correlated manner with some of the other pairs. And so what we can do is we can do one of these kinds of assembly detection algorithms with uh, independent component analysis, and try to find the reduced dimensionality that's describing the overall variance in this data set. And that's also going to be part of the lab that I'm going to show you um, this afternoon, how we get from this kind of matrix to that kind of and so critically, what we can do is we can look to see, in this reduced space, are there changes that happen before and after the stimulation? Do the, uh, the synapse ensembles, we're calling them, that we detect beforehand emerge post-stimulation? And it looks like that uh, doesn't seem to be the case. Um, what we can do is we can de detect the ensembles um, before the stimulation, and then we can look to see how often we see those ensembles that we did, um, in the pre stimulation trials as compared to the post-stimulation trials. And when we compare our stimulation case to control and actually to see through the dentate where we don't observe remapping, we get much more synapsomble um, reorganization 
um, in the stimulation case. And this is true if we detect the ensembles before the stimulation or if we detect the ensembles after the stimulation and then compare it to beforehand. Um, and so I think that we need to do some more work to say that actually this is the mechanism that's driving the remapping, but at least it's all consistent with an idea that if you have a local reorganization of these lateral inhibitory circuits, this could explain the way that a place field that wasn't stimulated could actually change its receptive field properties. Um, and so the conclusion um, that the, we can in, in deduct um, new place field changes, um, and this seems to correlate with excitatory inhibitory coupling. Um, we can see the changes uh, may induce remapping even in neurons that we're not directly touching with our light. Um, and it's, for me, it's extremely exciting because it means that we can have these kinds of attractor dynamics and memory storage in a network in a part of the brain that doesn't have very strong excitatory excitatory coupling. I think a lot of the theoretical modeling is focused on the ways that excitatory neurons drive other excitatory neurons. And here, almost all of the interactions between neighboring neurons are happening through lateral inhibition. And so if we can have plasticity in those circuits, it means we can have actually rich kind of memory and memory dynamics in CA1 that's normally ascribed to the upstream CA3 region that's known to have dense excitatory recurrence. Um, and that, you know, this quick gating that I showed you means that the synaptic coupling is really dynamically regulated. Um, that I think that a lot of people think that the neural computation is just kind of integrated fire, where you take all of the different inputs, you sum them up, you put them through a nonlinear operator, and the cell should go. I'm saying that actually you can have a very strong synapse, and that that could be effectively turned off. And I'm starting to think of the, of the dendritic tree more and more like a set of transistors, where each of the inputs can be gated to go on or off to drive spiking at the soma. Um, and so, coming back to this kind of plot that I showed you at the beginning, when I asked you to think about um, these different events that are happening in different locations, I imagine that there's some inhibitory population now which is setting this up, this correlation structure. And somehow, just by virtue of me telling you to organize your information along a different dimension, it's going to activate another set of these interneurons, which is going to be causing some of these um, neurons to be firing synchronously at the expense of another population. Um, and so, I think we're a long way from actually having the frank model for that sentence. Um, I forget the, the right word that we described to talk about these kinds of abstract schemas that we're using to, to talk about a, um, how we think the, the brain is working. Um, and so with this, I'd like to give my acknowledgments. Um, I've been working with Yuri Bajaki now for five years. He's been a, an amazing mentor. Um, Roman Huzar has spent the last year putting together this synopsonal um, detection algorithm. And uh, he has really been a uh, big intellectual force in getting this to work, to move more from just being an abstract idea, but to being a tool that you guys can now all use, basically with the push of a button on your data set. Um, Dan English, um, he's uh, got, a, he did the juxtacellular stimulation experiment. He's the kind of guy that can just make an experiment work. Um, if you have the opportunity or career to find a collaborator to work with, it, science was never more fun than when I was working with him. Um, Talfin Evans um, and uh, uh, Dan Levinson and, and John Plakovich, they did some of the statistics for uh, generating the synapse detection algorithm, which is also part of the package that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. And um, these guys here, they developed the micro-LED probes. Um, so thank you very much for your attention.
that connectivity pattern? I, that's, that's the hypothesis. So then would you expect a higher, um, dis or would you expect that the couplings would change to a greater extent if you put the mouse in a novel environment? Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would predict that. Or a larger environment might uh, sort of involve more special connectivity if you if you're in a very large environment compared to a smaller environment. Because actually it would matter if you have I don't know what you mean by the more connectivity, but I like the idea that the complexity of the environment might describe the number of synapse ensembles that I would need to describe all the variants. Yeah. And uh, I've been thinking about this also with disease models too, um, that as neurons die, maybe you need fewer and fewer different assemblies to explain all of the variants in your data. The idea is that since larger environments require more larger play scales that are more likely to be concentrated in ventral, um, say one therefore. But you still have small place fields even in a big environment yeah. can see it. And the but you don't have those big ones in the small environment. But the cells will fire everywhere in the small environment. And the, if, you, if you are in a small environment you record eventually, the cells are still firing. They just fire everywhere. Sure, but in addition, would it matter a lot? Because they don't need to discriminate anymore. So the large place fields that would need to discriminate this and large parts of time, sort of a bigger environment, they, they're discriminable in the larger environment. They're not discriminable. Model. So they don't need to That's it. I understand. Maybe. Yes. I found that result of the remapping lasting two or three hours after the experiment really intriguing. I was wondering how far in time you think that lasts and if another stimulus that's just random in nature will change the local ensemble. Or does it have to be a competing stimulus or something? So to, I don't know the answer to your first question. That's the, the two to three hours is the longest time point that I've tested. Um, it's very hard to track these same cells you know, for overnight. Um, in terms of the random stimulation, I've tried many times to just stimulate pairs of neurons in the animal's home cage and see changes in the baseline correlation structure. And I just can't do it. Um, I've done closed loop experiments where I detect a presynaptic spike and depolarize a postsynaptic neuron and then looked at the, the coupling between the two. Even after thousands of pairings, I don't see any systematic change. I've done in CA3, trying to pair two different anatomical locations in CA3, thousands of pairings, like hours and hours, and I don't see changes in the baseline dynamics. Um, so maybe you do need to have, um, you know, it's a, an eligibility trace is not enough. Like maybe you need to actually have some kind of neuromodulatory juice to make these connection strengths change, and maybe dopaminergic stimulation or neuroadrenaline is going to be an additional component. With these kinds of experiments when the animal's on the track, the pseudocholine levels are high, the animal's getting rewarded on either end, you know, maybe this is why I have some kind of success. I'm also, every time I stimulate, I'm kind of clamping what's the presynaptic input. Well, when I stimulate randomly, the brain can be in any random state. And so every time I stimulate, if you assume that there's a slow learning rate of these synapses here, then I'm just kind of like changing something slowly in one random state, changing something slowly in another random state. Um, and maybe this is why I haven't been able to make those experiments work. So suppose we want to help Jeremy with this vision of using AI to make us all incredibly fast learners. But in addition to this system, we also have access to stimulating specific interneurons. Like, is there some way we could use sort of what you've done here to speed up learning in Jeremy's system? If we really want somebody to understand that this context is different from this other context, is there some kind of optimal yeah. stimulation pattern that could help that person separate those contexts? So first, I, I don't know. Right? Like, <laughs> I think that every time, every time I hear that somebody wants to increase the rate of learning, I just keep on thinking about the plasticity stability dilemma. And you know, I've worked really hard to create a set of attractors where I can now navigate them along all of these different kinds of arbitrary dimensions. And so if you're going to have me increase my rate of uh, learning French in the next hour, you know, what's going to happen to my Spanish? So I think that um, playing around with some of these um, kinds of networks, then maybe you can actually figure out, all right, what does the internal that I need to push to give me the biggest kinds of anti-correlations between two different things? Let's push that and try to learn, well, what's going to happen with all of the things that uh, that internal was meant to be doing for other uh, sets of relationships? Um, so I think I would hope that um, when you're doing these kinds of fast learning paradigms, you kind of do a, a, an A, B, A kind of test to look to see how good people are remembering the things that they knew beforehand. Discussions in the notion of consolidation and then also not changes during it. That. 
Some studies suggest with shocking animals, and they suggest that three hours might be enough for rodents for conservation. Some say no, it has to be 24 hours. Some say there's different stages, and one is 72 hours. Were there any situations where the rodent was sleeping in the two, three hours? Uh, all the situations. In all of those situations. Yeah. And was there a wake control so that there's a comparison of whether never, this... I never did that. No. So I guess this relates to the safety questions a bit because when you're awake, there might be more interference as opposed to when you're sleeping and you can replay those sequences. Yeah, and you know, you know, there's some variability. Uh, not every cell is maintaining what it did. Right? Maybe you can find some examples here that don't look very similar. Maybe in that session the apple was waking and sleeping more. I don't know. It's it's an interesting idea, that's for sure. Yes? Uh, do you look at sharp wave ripples at all? Do you see like more of them to do remapping or the cells that aren't stimulated but remap? You know, I've, I've, I've started to do this analysis. Um, and it's, the fact that we see this kind of receptive field plasticity, I'd be really shocked if the changes that we saw after the stimulation are not also incorporated into the changes that we see in ripples. But I would like to say that actually um, these are not totally random, that when we see the spikes from these place fields that pop up, we can look to see what was the cell doing with a couple of spikes in those positions even beforehand. Mm -hmm. They're firing in the right places. And they're firing in the right places even at the right phase of theta, and they're also firing in the right beta sequence even beforehand. Mm -hmm. And so when you see these new place fields pop up, it's actually a kind of a unleashing a latent structure that was there already, which is another reason why I think that this change in lateral ambition could be such a powerful mm -hmm. mechanism. Something was controlling its firing rate, but the overall integration of that cell within the, the network existed even a priori. Great. Well, thanks, Sam. Thank Before we break for